get started? Yes, go ahead, Karen. Okay. Well, official good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for being with us. And my name is Karen Jahanian. I'm going to go through a few housekeeping items, and then we will, uh, and then I'll turn things over to Mary Grace, and she'll uh, get this awesome webinar going. So uh, hopefully everyone is on the correct webinar inside the Masto Truck Parking Info Management Program. Those of you who have joined a coalition webinar in the past know that we try to create as much of a, an in-person meeting as possible with this virtual meeting experience. And we ask that everyone will mute their line. You can do that by pressing star six or simply by pressing the mute button on your phone. If you would like to make a comment or ask a question, you can do that either verbally or in the chat box. And on the, <clears throat> and we'll show you how to do that in a minute, the chat box. Please don't place us on hold because your hold music, everyone will hear it. And we know that you don't want that. It becomes very disturbing. People get flummoxed. So um, please don't place us on hold. And this web meeting is being recorded. The meeting materials will be available to everyone after the meeting. And you'll receive an email with um, either the materials themselves or a link to access the materials. If you would like to ask a question. OK, so someone who joined. Um, you're hearing an echo of a bit, so we'll resolve that in short order. So we encourage everyone to participate. If you want to participate verbally, please say your name and your agency before asking the question so that we have some context and the, the responder has some context in terms of uh, who is asking the question. And in the interim, we ask that everyone keep their line muted. If you would like to pose a question into the chat box, uh, Justin just gave a demonstration uh, below, and I will now respond to him at Justin. Thank you. And that is the preferred way. So that way, if you're asking a question after uh, the speaker has already presented, please direct your question to that individual, and then they'll be able to respond in the chat box or we'll um, respond at the next uh, appropriate break. And I can't stress it enough. Please mute your line if you are not speaking. And I'm going to ask everyone except for those who are speaking to do that at this time. And with that, I will turn the floor over to Mary Grace. Good morning, Karen. Good morning, everyone. Welcome. Um, I want to thank uh, those of you who took time to, are taking time to attend today. Um, really appreciate you, and also to our speakers. Um, I'm going to start in a few minutes with some quick introductions, and then I'm going to kind of short circuit the introductions and just go by agency since we have a large group here. Um, we can certainly share who attended. Um, but just to make an, a few remarks, um, I don't think we need to talk about the challenges in truck parking. They're certainly well documented. And I think the presence of everyone here highlights the concern on this issue and also the interest on finding um, innovative ways to continue to address it. Um, obviously, the, the host of issues in front of us include you know, capacity problems, um, information issues. This project today, um, really, uh, our focus is on uh, the coalition, the webinar, to, in, to look inside the MASTO TIMS project. Uh, we've had a lot of, um, of, of knowledge uh, through, through media, through um, presentations about this effort. Um, it was a significant undertaking by eight states in the Midwest, led by Kansas DOT, and it certainly required a, a large amount of coordination and collaboration. Um, and it's been a, a very successfully received project. Today, we want to have the opportunity for you all to learn and hear about those experiences but also to understand in more detail um, how states were able to work together on a multi-state basis as a group, collectively, looking to have a, a consistent uh, message uh, for truckers that they were able to access, but also looking at the needs of individual organizations within this larger project. So with that, I just want to say some quick introductions. 
Um, I'm going to introduce our speakers as we begin to present, so I'll hold on that. But I just want to note in terms of our presence here today, um, we have, I'm just going to go over quickly, a representation from, from DOTs. We have Alabama, Connecticut, Delaware, Florida, Georgia, Maryland State Highway Authority. We have uh, Massachusetts, North Carolina, New Jersey, New York, Pennsylvania, South Carolina, Tennessee, Virginia, and Rhode Island State Planning. We also have a number of metropolitan planning organizations, Baltimore Metro, CDTC, WMAPCO, NIMTEC, and JTPA. Um, so, and if there's any, anybody I didn't mention, uh, give me a high sign or make a note in the chat box. Um, and within that, there's a, a number of people um, uh, present. I think PennDOT gets the, um, the, the award for the most number of people present uh, joining us today, so that's certainly appreciated. And I hope this is helpful for all of you in the work that you're doing. So with that, I'd like to move forward and get into our presentation. Go ahead, Karen. And on my end, I might have just a slight delay. Um, let me start just quickly overviewing our object, our, our um, agenda. We're going to start with an overview from Corey Davis and Brian Comer. Corey's with Kansas DOT and Brian with HNTB, uh, giving an overview on the overall Masto Regional Truck Parking Project. We're then going to hear uh, Phil Mesher isn't able to join us today. Um, but Eric Stack, and Chuck, Eric Strack, and Chuck Miller from HNTB on, on Phil's behalf will be talking about Iowa DOT truck parking project and the approach that they took. Um, Scott Grenner and Carl Rendell from Truck Specialized Parking Services are going to give you the perspective from one of the third parties that's been involved in implementing truck parking technologies and engaging with the private sector on what the kind of work is that they had to do in this type of a project. And last but not least, um, Andrew Andrusco from Minnesota DOT is going to give you a different perspective on how they approach the project, um, looking at Minnesota DOT's truck, truck parking project and the work they did in this effort. With that, when we're done, um, I will give a time, some time after each speaker to ask some questions. Um, we have a large group and a lot to cover, so we'll certainly kind of marshal and watch that time. But then we'll also have time again at the end um, for questions. And as Karen noted, um, you know, if you put them in the chat box, we can make every effort to get to all of them, and then we'll wrap up. Um, so with that, um, let me start by introducing um, our first um, presenters. First, Corey Davis is the Assistant Bureau Chief for Transportation Planning for Kansas DOT. Corey and his team provide oversight for six Kansas metropolitan planning organizations, over 140 transit agencies. They also oversee freight and rail activities and transportation alternatives program. Corey is responsible for multiple programs in the Bureau of Transportation Planning, including the Office of Public Transportation Programs and these MP metropolitan planning programs the freight and rail unit and the bicycle and pedestrian program. He also manages various transportation planning projects for the DOT, and he has the, um, uh, the luxury of having um, taken over this project from Devonna Moore, um, and I know he'll keep continuing on with the good work that she started, and, and we'll hear about that today. Uh, Brian Comer, um, who's a planner and senior project manager with HNTB, uh, on behalf of Kansas DOT, has more than 20 years of experience with an economic benefit cost analysis, transportation plans, quarter management plans, land use, and community facilitation. During the Masto Tims project, he assisted KDOT with the regional coordination of these eight partner states and FHWA to include assistance with the Tiger Grant reporting. Um, so I want to welcome Corey and Brian and also Gretchen Ivey, who also was part of the HNTB team. Thank you for being here today, and I'm turning this over to you to present. All right, thank you, Mary Grace. Um, um, I'm just going to kick things off from a KDOT perspective, talk about the relationships that were built and how this uh, project came to fruition, and then I'll hand it over to Brian to uh, break down the details of the, the project and, and get into some more of the, the technical information. Um, so uh, as Mary Grace um, mentioned, we at Kansas DOT are the lead state on the project. Uh, we had active leadership back when this was uh, coming to fruition. and. Um, ultimately, we're the one that hit submit on the application for the Tiger uh, grant application, so uh, we were um, in the role of, of managing the project uh, and coordinating with uh, USDOT and Federal Highway. Um, this was an eight-state partnership, 
um, with a lot of flexibility in between the states, Indiana, Iowa, Kansas, Kentucky, Michigan, Minnesota, Ohio, and Wisconsin. Um, so it was a, a group effort with a lot of coordination in between states, um, but uh, once again, a lot of flexibility in between the technologies and the deployment and timelines and, and how that, that moved forward. Um, in, in our role at the Kansas DOT, we were the recipient of the funds. We then uh, distributed them um, according to uh, what the grant application uh, called for and what the other states need, and we've modified that as, as time has gone on. As you all know, projects change over time. Um, but in that lead role, we, we've managed agreements from state to state and uh, have, have coordinated with uh, Federal Highway and USDOT on grant amendments uh, for the overall grant as well. Um, ultimately, the goal of this project was to enhance truck parking along key corridors in the, the Midwest region. Uh, we, the benefits of it are increased efficiency, cost savings, better quality of life for drivers, and, um, and Brian will get into some of the performance measures that we're, we're now uh, looking into as a part of the project uh, to measure its impact over the next three years as a part of the Tiger grant. Um, in mentioning Brian uh, and Gretchen and the entire HNTB team, uh, we contracted with them to uh, support the project, and without their support, um, I don't believe the project would have been near as success successful as it has been. Uh, so we really appreciate that partnership and their, their support in making this progress, uh, this project uh, move forward. So with that, as uh, Mary Grace mentioned, I came on in this role um, kind of post-implementation, halfway through implementation. And I know a lot of the, the questions and, and the thought of this presentation is to understand how this all came to fruition. So I'm going to let Brian uh, walk through the, the process of, of how this project came together and how it was uh, how it became a successful project. So Brian, if, if you wouldn't mind taking over here, I, I really appreciate it. All right, thank you, Corey. Um, so um, to date, uh, the, the the project actually opened um, in January, early January of last year, um, and we had deployed 130, more than 130 now, because states are, are looking at adding additional sites, uh, public and private sites um, within the eight states. So uh, they're mostly public rest areas. Uh, there's a few way stations. Um, and then there are private sites deployed as part of this project in Iowa and Kentucky, and Michigan has deployed private sites uh, in the past. Uh, I will note, um, in addition to the states that Corey had mentioned, uh, Missouri and Illinois did not join as part of the initial uh, Tiger Grant application back in 2015. However, they have expressed interest in, in deploying um, similar system or addressing uh, truck parking, and now they're actually participating in our coordination calls. So in terms of how the system works, um, obviously we're collecting um, vehicle uh, detection um, at each of the public rest areas, way stations, and, and private sites where applicable. So uh, the project actually included uh, deploying ITS equipment um, and uh, really analyzing uh, truck parking availability uh, at each of these sites. Uh, included within that is the central processing and aggregating of this data and then disseminating it um, through multiple avenues, uh, including um, roadside dynamic message signs, like shown here, uh, state 511 traveler information uh, websites uh, and applications, and also making sure uh, that the data, data is available free uh, to public third-party application developers, which we'll talk through here in a few minutes. So, uh, it was important that the states uh, collect this information, and one of the key things that we decided early on is we wanted to be able to make sure that we get the information out to um, as wide a variety of avenues uh, as possible, um, and really we checked in with our stakeholders to kind of determine how they would get the information and, and how they would use the information. So in terms of the, of the partnership uh, coordination, uh, because this was a federal TIGER grant, um, we had a deadline in terms of that, uh, that implementation. I think we really got started uh, really in, in 2016, and we needed to deploy this by 2019, so it was important uh, that we all work uh, together as seamlessly as possible. So um, we had regular uh, coordination calls uh, biweekly through design. Uh, we had monthly calls through construction just to make sure that we were maintaining our timeline. And then now we meet quarterly to go over performance measures. But the key thing I want to highlight that was really important at key decision points 
uh, we had in-person meetings, even though um, you know we were all we were scattered throughout these eight states. It was important that we come together face-to-face uh, -face in person with the key decision makers, and we actually made decisions um, at each of the major milestones. So uh, during project kickoff, it was important that we were all agreed on in terms of the goals, uh, the number of sites, and how we were approaching the system. Uh, when we got into the concept of operations and the system requirements, it was important uh, for us to decide. Um, you know, the seamless aspects of, of the system, uh, and then uh, to make sure that we were uh, for schedule adherence, even through uh, PSNE approvals, testing and burn-in, we had regular touch points uh, with, with the coalition to make sure that, that everybody was on track. Because ultimately, uh, because again, as Corey had, had mentioned, because they had pressed the button, uh, really they were the ones that were reporting to FHWA on behalf of all of the states, but we needed to meet regularly to make sure that everybody uh, was heading in the same direction. In terms of the funding and grant administration, um, it was a $25 million TIGER grant. I will note that in 2018, really late in the project, uh, the, the states were awarded $6.25 million in additional federal funds. Um, one of the things that we had done early on is we identified the sites that were a part of the original TIGER grant application. Uh, but the states actually identified additional public rest areas and private sites that they would like to deploy. Uh, so uh, through the uh, early planning and systems engineering, we cleared additional sites uh, through NEPA and incorporated them um, within our procurements uh, to provide the flexibility um, if, if extra funding did become available that we would be able to deploy those sites. And just through active discussions with uh, FHWA and USDOT, there was some additional money that was available uh, that we were able to use on the project. As Corey had mentioned, uh, KDOT is the lead agency, um, and KDOT uh, had a master agreement um, with USVOT uh, and then developed individual state-to-state -state agreements with their partner states. So those individual state agreements uh, passed down uh, the requirements uh, for the, the, the grant that KDOT had with USVOT and it included their individual scopes and budget so that they could manage their individual projects, uh, which was very important. Uh, the states also uh, initially set aside a portion of the funding right off the top uh, for uh, regional coordination and services. So the development of the concept of operations and system requirements uh, that was a part of, of the overall project, 30% uh, design, and um, importantly, and I can't emphasize this enough, a regional project oversight on this project. So again, uh, Kansas was responsible uh, for reporting and organizing the meetings uh, with our assistance. Uh, so it was really helpful to identify um, that budget off of the top to really be able to do that regional coordination. And it also assisted the states just in terms of, of travel and other things uh, that were set aside as part of the project so that we could make sure that we maintain that coordination. And it really helped us develop a seamless project and it's helping us uh, kind of coordinate ongoing uh, with one another. So it was really important, an important aspect of the project. Uh, in terms of the seamless coordination, when we met initially uh, to really uh, design the system, uh, one of the big factors that we had to, to uh, you know, um, discuss between the states is, um, you know, how we would deploy a seamless system to the end user. And it was really important when we talked to uh, the trucking community and stakeholders, it was important to them that they had a seamless system because uh, they really don't recognize borders in terms of freight, you know, between the states. Uh, they want that um, truck parking availability. They want uh, consistent uh, accuracy and reliability of the system. So it was important uh, for the things uh, from the end user's perspective in terms of the signs uh, and, and the accuracy and reliability that those things remain consistent. Uh, but the things that are behind the scenes that they don't necessarily see, like the data collection method, uh, the specific technologies, how the states are going to procure the projects, those things remain flexible amongst the states. Um, and this is really important, especially when you're talking eight states within the Masco region, and I'm, I'm sure it's similar, obviously, uh, in the I-95 co coalition, uh, public rest areas are different, the configurations are different. Um, you know, whether you're going to deploy public or private sites within the states, that was a decision that was made within the individual states, uh, and individual procurements are different within each of those states. So we provided the flexibility, and each state had their own independent, you know, scopes and budgets that they were to implement. Um, so we had our, our, our seamless uh, regional consistency, but we provided that flexibility 
uh, within each of the states to deploy their own system. Uh, the same pertained uh, in terms of data sharing and archiving. So uh, one of the things that we had to decide is, um, are we going to collect all of this information and disseminate it um, from, you know, one central database, or are we going to let each of the individual states uh, provide their own data feed? And uh, one of the things that was decided for MASTO is, um, because I think there was some concerns with not knowing what's going on with individual state budgets and priorities, um, that we wanted to make sure that the states were committed uh, but each state was responsible for providing their own public data feed. Um, but we collect the information in terms of the archive data feed uh, collectively. Uh, the Mid-America Freight Coalition, which is really the research arm of MASPO, uh, collects the archive data and is helping us with performance measures. But in terms of the, of the public-facing data, each of the individual states provide their own feed. Uh, so what allowed us to really be, to be able to do that is, uh, you know, through our collective discussions, we developed um, a public data feed that was uh, completely consistent for the end users. So each of the, the data feed format that the states are putting out is completely consistent between the states. So a third-party application developer uh, that's picking up each of the individual data feeds uh, is consistent, which really helps them design their app. Uh, and for consistency of the data. So that was really important that that was uh, completely consistent for them, allowing each of the individual states to provide their own feed. Uh, dynamic message signs were also consistent because this is something that would be, uh, and it was important to the end user, but I will also note other considerations. Uh, we coordinated with uh, FHWA and MUTCD, which also had input on uh, the consistency uh, of the signs. So. Seven of the eight states uh, deployed um, roadside dynamic message signs like you see here uh, with the exception of Iowa, and we'll talk about that um, here in a few minutes in terms of the Iowa's considerations for not deploying signs. Uh, but it's provided on, on the signs as well as um, other third-party applications, which you see here. So uh, these are currently some of the companies that include TSPS uh, that are providing, that are picking up our data feed and providing it through those third-party applications as well as state traveler information uh, websites and applications. Uh, in terms of performance measures, um, it was important to FHWA that we track these measures, but it was also important uh, that once we've implemented, we've been, uh, we've been uh, implemented now for um, a little over a year, uh, that we understand uh, parking utilization and, and demand cycles. So certainly we're hearing from truckers that they want more parking, but one of the things that the system allows us to do is to actually understand how over capacity that we really are at these sites. So we know the true parking availability at all times because of the system is providing that information. Uh, corridor safety was another uh, important metric, and, and we're really evaluating that through um, hours of service violations. We're really looking at the change of hours, hour, hours of service violations over time. Uh, system accuracy and reliability, we set thresholds and standards for these for the states to meet. And we're actually analyzing that uh, through uh, their performance measures and really evaluating each individual site, which is rolling up to the states, which rolls up regionally as well. Um, and in terms of reliability, we're looking at system downtime, user complaints, and overall accuracy of the system. And then it was also important, because each of the individual states um, are providing these feeds, uh, we wanted to make it easy uh, for the information um, for third-party application developers or truckers or companies to be able to pick up the information. So we do have a centralized website that includes a link uh, to each of the states so that they could pick up that data feed as well as just overall information on the project. And uh, this is something that we've been kind of promoting uh, through each of the states. We put billboards out uh, and, and a lot of engagement out within the states to advertise our Trucks Park Here um, website. Uh, and resources, but we do provide kind of a central repository of, of access to that information on that centralized website. Uh, so with that, I can go ahead and open it up to any questions on the regional aspect of the project. Thanks, Brian. Does anybody have any questions right now for Brian or Corey? Oh, and here's one from Ian. And uh, Strauss Weider from NJTPA asks, how do you handle spaces that are unoccupied but reserved, similar to hotel rooms? Are you using um, any reserve systems? So there's no in? reservation systems as part of, of as part of our system. So some individual, so private truck stops 
um, want to implement reservation systems. And, and to be honest, that was one of the reasons that a lot of the larger public truck stops didn't participate in the system. So the states that were um, deploying at private sites, um, you know, typically rest area or our truck stops that wanted to implement reservation systems didn't want to be a part of our system. But it was important that we're providing our data for free for anyone that wants it. Uh, so that was kind of a key consideration as part of that. Okay. Thank you, Brian. And um, Autumn Young from Florida DOT asked, and I know we're going to cover a little bit of this under TSPS, yeah. and, um, and you could decide to reserve it or do now, but she, she did ask about what types of vehicle detection devices did you find were the most accurate? Um, and I think okay. they're going to talk a little here. bit about types, but yeah, yeah, do you have a perspective on it? Yeah, I'll throw it over to, uh, to Chuck Miller and Eric Strack to, to kind of talk about that, because we're just starting that evaluation now in terms of the performance. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I think that, And then, uh, oh, go ahead. Go ahead, Eric. Yeah, so this is, is Chuck, sorry. Um, oh, Chuck. I, while we'd like to all have one silver bullet detection technology, um, what we found is that um, they all have their pros and cons, and, and um, you know, have their, their the good and bad points. And it really, a lot of it depends on the configuration of your area. So one technology may not work in one configuration and another technology may work in another configuration. Um, this is, it's been a good, um, will provide a good research um, application because every state ended up essentially doing a slightly different technology for monitoring truck parking spots. So um, we're, we're kind of getting that information now, but at this point, I think we've, I think we've, I guess, found generally that magnetometers um, have worked well, and and um, the space, if you can monitor space occupancy, that really is the more, is proving to be more accurate at this point, depending on, what, you know, no matter what technology you use, monitoring individual space occupancy. Whenever you're counting trucks entering and exiting, it is uh, more difficult than I ever thought it would be to count trucks entering and exiting, and there is definitely an operational component you're going to have to reset the system at least daily, if not twice a day, uh, to maintain your accuracy, uh, no matter what technology you're using, counting uh, trucks entering and exiting parking areas. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Chuck. And Josh O'Neill from Rhode Island State Planning has sort of two questions. He says, how are you sending real-time information to truck apps like Trucker Path Pro? You know, as you created a common API, does that go out from each TNC directly to the app developers, or, or is there a combination where they go to the trucks park here? And I'm going to add to that, since you're going to ask this question, when you allow them to access that, that, that API, do you have any requirements for the companies that access it in terms of, you know, a data use agreement or something that requires them to have some level of, you know, uh, amount of time that they update their system, or you just um, let them have it. So I'll kind of make that a three-part question because um, I think that's sort of the common sense that comes around it. So how are you sending it? Is there a common API from each or directly? Um, and, you know, do you require anything on the side of the people that are that are actually coming and grabbing your data? Right. So we, we actually reached out to the application developers early on and let them know that the system was coming and we've been in contact with them. Um, we also provide all of the links up to each of the individual states on that Truck Spark here website. Uh, it's important that the state said that the, the data should be made available free to anybody that wants it. Now, the individual states, in terms of the decision, um, some of them require them to sign in um, to be able to they can still get the data for free, but they, you know, typically they want some information about the, the developer and that sort of thing just so they can kind of maintain dialogue and kind of know who's uh, using their system. Other states are providing it completely free. They're just providing that that okay. link right up there and it's open to anybody. So that's really a kind of a state dependent um, uh, in, in terms of, of, of if they're requiring some sort of access key. And I guess a little more on the technology side, we've got, uh, it's a JSON-based um, web service that each state has implemented that allows the third-party app application developers to grab the data in, from each state. Okay, great. And then one more question and then we can circle back around to you all. Um, Tom Phelan asked, how did you measure occupancy outside designated parking spaces? Obviously, it's an important consideration where utilization is consistently exceeding capacity. So how are you addressing that right now in the project? So that was one of our big discussion points early on. Um, and at the time, in terms of how we move forward, we decided that we would only monitor designated parking spots. 
not, um, you know, on, you know we, we call informal parking areas. Uh, so those are not a part of uh, what is provided uh, in terms of the availability or capacity of the lot. Yeah. I was going to say, however, um, we do with the in and out count locations, we do have a count of how many trucks are in the lot, but we do not advertise spaces available above what is marked on the sign. So the highest the sign would ever say, if the lot has 20 marked spaces, it would say 20. Our system might tell us there are 27 trucks in that lot. Um, if we monitored in and out counts at that at that site, and this is and this is Gretchen, and and that's one of the reasons we went with sort of a low threshold when it gets to a certain level of you know it's it's full and there's only a certain number of spaces left because it leaves a little flexibility for um, truck drivers to kind of make their determination of whether they think there might be some informal parking use they could do without us putting a, a specific number that they might um, find to be inaccurate because in their minds they are counting. What we found through talking with the truck drivers is in their minds, many times they are counting that informal parking. So it, it is a big consideration. That's a good point, Gretchen. Thank you. Any other comments? Questions? OK. Um, so I'm going to thank Corey and Brian and Gretchen and also um, Eric and Chuck for, Chuck for chiming in. And I know we're going to turn to the next. Just a couple quick updates. Um, I also wanted to mention um, Metropolitan Washington Council of Governments is here today. I didn't have this. I didn't mention them. And also, uh, as Brian mentioned, Missouri DOT. Um, I'm very pleased that Cheryl Ball and, and staff from the Missouri DOT are joining us, um, good friends of the coalition and, and peers in other areas, and obviously very interested in this project. So um, I wanted to note their presence. And just uh, for fair disclosure, we do have four uh, people here from consulting firms that are on staff uh, working or working uh, directly right now with some of our agencies. So I wanted to make that clear because I know we didn't open this um, you know, fully, but those consulting firms that are here are representing specific agencies that they're working with. So with that, I want to move over next um, to our next presenters on behalf of Phil Mesher from Iowa DOT. Um, first, we have Eric Strack, who's the project manager for HNTB for Iowa DOT, um, presenting on the Iowa DOT truck parking project. Eric has experience in ITS planning and design, roadway design, site design, environmental planning, GIS and traffic engineering. He's assisted at KDOT in the master states with the CONOPS and system requirements. Um, the design of the Kansas T-PIM system is currently assisting Iowa DOT with oversight of their T-PIM's deployment. Also presenting with Eric is Chuck Miller, um, who is Director of Intelligent Transportation Systems and the Senior Project Manager for HNTB um, for Iowa DOT. Chuck has more than 30 years of experience in transportation planning, engineering, and ITS, and he leads IT, uh, HNTB's Intelligent Transportation Systems practice in the state of Iowa, Kansas, Missouri, Nebraska, and Oklahoma. He's the task leader for ITS for the Master Truck Parking System, with, um, in which we we're talking about here today. And he's the project manager for the final TPIMS design in Kansas. So uh, both Eric and Chuck, thanks for stepping in for Phil. And I'm turning it over to you. Welcome. Thank you. Um, yes, Phil Mesker sent his uh, regards. He is on spring break this week and was unable to make the call. Uh, but he wanted to make sure that Iowa DOT got highlighted here. Um, he was the Iowa DOT deployment. We kind of want to go through some of the technology deployed, the sites they deployed at, some of their methodology for procurement, and then some of the unique aspects um, of the Iowa deployment as well. Um, they did have a very large deployment. As it turned out, they had 43 sites deployed. Um, there are some reasons that they were able to deploy so many sites we'll get into here in a few minutes. They got 29 public sites, including um, rest areas, truck parking areas, and way stations. And they had 14 private sites, um, private truck stops, casinos, McDonald's, um, that we will be able to cover here. The I the Iowa TPIMS deployment did focus, as you see, along I-80. Um, they We did end up monitoring some rest areas and truck stops that were just close to I-80 along other interstate corridors. Um, <clears throat> so getting into the type of sites again, um, lots of public rest areas, the two way stations um, by Des Moines, 
Um, truck stops is where I think you're going to want to hear what we what we experienced. We were able to have a casino, have a McDonald's. Um, there was no participation by pilot or TA. Um, they have a oh, that's true. We do have one TA. Um, <clears throat> there's no participation by most of those. Um, they have interest in their own reservation system. The exception is the I-80 truck stop. The quote world's largest truck stop is part of this system. They have some. Uh, 560 spaces or so, and, and they are um, actively being monitored and part of the system as kind of a pilot for TA. <clears throat> so our contracting approach, um, Iowa DOT looked at what they wanted to do with this data and what they were doing, and they decided they wanted to basically purchase data from a vendor. So they hired a contractor to provide that data. Um, the contractor deploy their own equipment. They operate, maintain, reset. They maintain the system equipment and, and are paid to do that on a monthly basis. Um, and they provide the, d the data feed directly to the Iowa DOT and publicly, um, uh, publicly to everyone else, including MASB. So um, I think that, that we help them develop high-level system requirements. Um, we did that with all eight states, and we took those high-level system requirements and got them down to functional requirements for an RFP. Um, that RFP went through purchasing at the DOT, uh, where they were able to evaluate proposals for basically providing this data, including kind of what system they would deploy and how much it would cost. And um, it wasn't cost-based. It was most advantageous to the DOT was the way the selection was done. Um, so cost, of course, is a factor in there, as is how many sites and, um, and the technologies that were deployed. So they um, rolled all of those RFP con uh, requirements straight into the contract and did a kind of a two-phase deployment here. They, they deployed the public rest areas and started construction on those right away as soon as they could get materials in. And then during that time, um, the vendor was able to go out and get agreements with the private truck stops um, and, and everybody to kind of work through who was going to sign on to be part of the system. Those agreements, um, and this is kind of a lesson learned through our partnership, is the agreements seem to work much better when they're with a private party to the truck stop rather than a state DOT to the truck stop. We had, um, it was much harder for the state DOT to get those agreements in place than it was for a vendor. Um, so. They were able to then deploy those truck stops quickly thereafter, and and they they utilized you know the vendor was left to decide the technology, but they utilized kind of a blended approach. Um, they did space by space where they thought they could. They did ins and outs. You know, so the big truck stop we're talking about, they did in and out. It's too many spaces to put magnetometers in every space, um, but for most of the rest areas, they put magnetometers in the pavement to detect truck parking. They put two per stall just to get into it a little bit. And then they did um, fixed cameras with, with video analytics for the in and out counts. Um, they also had to provide PTZ cameras so that we could monitor the sites remotely and reset the system. And that was true of all sites across the Masto state is we had to be able to kind of see what the parking was and reset the system should it get off. So here's what the technology for the in space by space looks like. You can see they put two sensors per truck truck parking stall. They kind of put a central CTZ camera. Um, and here's kind of the pavement core they took out. There's the puck. There's the little green thing here. And then um, they would put it in and seal it up with epoxy and connect it to, up to the system. So uh, they have about a 10-year battery life, roughly 7 to 10 and um, are working well so far. So the driveway counting um, used video analytics with fixed cameras, and then they still had a PTZ to kind of verify the count at the lot. Um, dynamic message signs. And for this, I'm going to turn it over to Chuck Miller, who will, who will take over from here to discuss the Iowa. Now, we'll kind of move from um, initial initially discussing how they're monitoring the sites to talk about how the data um, is being disseminated. Um, as 
uh, Brian alluded to, um, Iowa was a little different than the rest of the states because they decided not to deploy roadside signs. At the time of this project, the uh, director at the DOT had a moratorium on um, deploying any dynamic message signs along roadways. Um, the benefit of that was that um, those signs cost money to deploy, so that allowed them to deploy, as Eric mentioned, a significant number of sites using the money that would have been spent on roadside signs. But the key there was Iowa DOT committed to um, doing what they could to use other technologies to provide the information out to those end users, to the truck drivers, um, through the data feed, through an enhanced 511, the data feeds then feeding into smartphone applications and in cab systems. Um, to go to the uh, to get to the point where they can not deploy the roadside signs, um, they did have to negotiate with FHWA. If you remember back on the cover of the uh, grant application, there was a big roadside sign, so it took some convincing to get FHWA to allow Iowa not to deploy signs. And, and to get that approval, Iowa decided or had to agree to do some additional evaluation, working with Iowa State University to assess. Um, the impact of not having roadside signs compared to the other seven states. So that's how they were allowed to move ahead without the roadside signs. As far as construction schedule, um, the contract with the vendor was signed in October 2017, and then all the original sites were deployed by mid-October 2018, so about a year um, from signing the contract to go through the design process and deploy the system. As Brian mentioned, the states, uh, the State Partnership got some additional funding. Iowa was one of the states that agreed to uh, use some of that funding to deploy some additional sites. So those sites are being finished up right now and should be done and uh, online in April of 2000, this April. Now I want to talk a little bit more about the information, I guess, dissemination and, and, and process. So we've got the um, rest areas and private truck stops for the data and the parking area availability is being monitored. That information is then passed to the, the contractor that is um, assessing availability, and they are providing a data feed, two data feeds. One data feed is being provided and available to those third-party application developers, and it is also being used, accessed by the Iowa DOT then to provide data for their 511 system. The second data feed has a little bit more information in it that's used for the performance measures and is being um, grabbed by the Mid-America Freight Coalition to do those performance measures. Well, since Iowa wasn't doing those roadside signs, they wanted to really enhance their 511 um, information they provided. They always had a, a trucker's uh, specific web page, and so they enhanced that um, with the information. Uh, here they added the icons. Here represent um, the T's of the private truck stops. The R's are the rest areas with truck parking and the P's are truck parking areas that um, don't have amenities. Um, these icons then are color-coded based on the um, how full the lots are, um, green meaning relatively empty all the way to uh, dark orange or red, uh, indicating that the, there's low avail availability in the lots. When you click on one of those icons, then you're taken to a, a web page for the specific parking area, and uh, this is an example of one for the public parking areas, and here, of course, you've got the availability and the number of spots in the lot. The shading of the sign kind of matches the color colors that are displayed on the overall graphic. Um, they also provide real-time uh, images from the parking areas from those PTZ cameras uh, for those parking areas, along with amenities, which are also provided in the, uh, in the data feed. For the uh, private truck parking areas, um, because of um, sensitivity um, with, privacy, for, with privacy issues, they are not providing the real-time uh, camera images. Um, this is just a, um, a static photo of the parking area itself, but then you have the availability information similar to what you have on the uh, public sites. Where they really, uh, I guess, uh, increased the functionality of their um, application, um, to provide the, the travel information and the truck parking availability information was in their um, mobile application, their smartphone application. Uh, of course, they display all the information that's on the website in a format that, that works on a smartphone, but they also deploy uh, a tool that uh, uses geo-referencing, and you can set 
or how many miles out you want to get information on that next parking area. So you select here like 20 miles out. As you're driving down the road, when you get within 20 miles of a parking area, it gives you a voice notification of the number of available uh, parking spots at that upcoming parking area. And then finally, um, I think Eric alluded to it a little bit, but um, you know, since they're paying the contractor for good data, the accuracy of their data, um, we're also involved in continued monitoring of the system um, to make sure they're meeting their contact contractual requirements. So we're looking at how often they're resetting the system, what the magnitude of those resets are. We're doing some graphical analysis to identify any abnormalities in uh, filling and emptying of lots that, that we, we need to check into additionally. And then we're also doing spot checks of specific parking areas on a bi-weekly basis. I'm comparing the video images, what we can see from the video, real-time video images to the number of parking spots the system is reporting. So with that, um, again, um, uh, Phil, Phil did wish he could be here today, but Phil's contact information is there if you want to talk to, in touch with Phil to uh, ask him any questions. And there's contact information for Eric and myself. So we'd be glad to take any questions now. Thanks very much, Eric and, and Chuck. Really appreciate it. Any questions? Um, I don't see any in the chat box right now, but um, I did get um, um, a question that arose in my mind. Well, here's one from Dave Rosenberg. Um, and I said, do we have, did you all have a threshold for determining how sites are full? Did you, did, you know, Gretchen indicated in the prior one that you didn't go above the actual spaces, but was there a threshold that, that you set or were those set individually or how did, how was that handled? Well, the, on the, um, I, guess, I don't think they're ever um, reporting them as being full. Um, I think they're using around 80 to 90 percent when they start reporting on the website that that they're um, nearing full. Um, I forget the exact wording here, not looking at it, but when they start reporting that they are getting near full, so it's around 80 to 90 percent. Um, they did program it so they could be a little flexible because some lots have more in and out activity, and they found that that flexibility is beneficial to be able to adjust that maybe somewhat lot specific. And the percentages were different, you know, based really on the size of the lot too. If you had a rest area that only had ten parking spaces available, it was it much more sensitivity to the low threshold um, than if you had a, a lot with two hundred spaces. And so, you know, I hate to say it depends, but it kind of did depend based on configuration and size of lot, and then the type of technology selected. And it's been a little bit of a, a back and forth. I mean, I think states are even still today trying to kind of mess with that just a bit and figure out the best low threshold to sit for each individual lot. Oh, thanks, Gretchen. Um, and Josh O'Neill from Rhode Island State Planning asked, um, obviously dynamic message signs are a deployment strategy besides the API and the JSON web interface. Um, he's asking about a survey of the trucking industry to see what truckers think is the best approach for data information. Um, I know that ATRI, has, as part of their trucking research, has done some work on this, and maybe that's something we can also share. But I think it sounds like from what you indicated, either Eric or Chuck, that in making the negotiation with Federal Highway to not use dynamic message signs, are you, in fact, collecting information to sort of get that feedback from truckers? And, and Again, beyond what we've heard generally in some of the ATRI research, did you get any direct um, feedback from the trucking industry yet? So we had some pre-deployment surveys that we had we had sent out, and um, and then we just had a post-deployment survey that's hot off the presses, and we're we're still reviewing that to kind of understand um, how users are actually using the system. And what we've heard leading up to it is um, truckers do have to lock their cell phones. Um, you know, they can't mm -hmm. use the cell phones when they're in the cab. Um, or it has to be like a one touch or voice activated um, a, a, a type of thing in terms of getting the information in the cab. So, you know, that's one of the reasons I think the majority of the, or seven of the eight states went ahead and, and moved forward with signs. So post-deployment, what we're seeing early on is um, truckers actually, they were saying their preference is uh, to be able to have this um, on, on their, you know, cell phones and in-cab systems and that, but they still recognize and note that, you know, if, if it's a cell phone, it has to be a one touch or, or voice activated. So I think there still is, you know, kind of concern uh, in terms of only providing, you know, 
a few avenues. And just, just to add to that, I think what we found through our surveys, and Aptree was the one that did our pre and post surveys, so they, they've been actively involved. Um, you know, if they're planning their, their trip in advance, if they're able to kind of take time when they're resting to plan the trip, they prefer that smartphone app or, or in-cab navigation system. But on the road when they're actually in motion, they really rely on the signs as, as the key thing that they can do while in motion. So it kind of depended right. whether they're in the pre-planning mode for their trip or actually on the road. And that's why Iowa actually set up their app the way they did is so that they could kind of pre-plan and set it up and then the, the app would actually turn red or notify them as there was changes in, in parking, um, you know, so that the driver wouldn't have to touch the phone. Mm -hmm. That's great. Thank you. And one last question. Um, uh, from Tom McQueen at Georgia. Um, what was the mechanism for a rest area that's closed? How are you entering that manually, or how is that notification made? Um, yeah, it is It is a manual process, and that was kind of one of the lessons learned not only in Iowa, but in the other states is um, that you need some good coordination with your maintenance folks, or even, uh, not in Iowa, but in another state, we had a closure because of law enforcement, and you need to have those lines of communication so you can, you know, set the system to indicate that the lot is closed. Okay. And then I think but just one last kind of, oh, sorry. Go sorry. Ahead. And just one last kind of quick question on another thing. When you were talking about the, the private sites and, and, and other some reserve sites there, on the private site side, did the state actually pay for deployment of technology in those sites, either out of the federal grant or out of state money, or would the private companies just do whatever they were doing and then agree to share. I was a little confused on, on how that was accomplished. Yeah, the the private sites were deployed with, with grant money provided they provide the data free of charge. So the agreement was between the private vendor and the private truck stop, but the grant money did build the equipment to provide that free data publicly. And it's maintaining okay. and it's maintaining the equipment also. The, the, yes, the true. The, you know, states paying the con their contractor to maintain that equipment. Okay, perfect. Thank you. All right, I think we'll, we're going to move on. Um, and again, we'll have some time at the end for some questions. So thank you to Eric and, and Chuck, and also again to Gretchen and Brian for circling around with some answers. Um, next, I, I have um, Scott Grenners and Carl Rondell um, talking about the master truck parking system um, from the perspective of a, of a third-party provider. So you heard them mention that there's a variety of ways that information is being um, moved out. Um, and in the case of, of CSPS, um, they both provide that data, collecting it from agencies, and they're also directly involved in the um, in, in, in working in the Iowa deployment. Um, so uh, as you listen to them, think about you know these are the, these are the folks that are taking this information among others and, and putting it out to the public. So this perspective, I'm excited to have them bring. Scott Grenners is a consultant with PSPS. He currently works with public and private sectors to provide truck parking solutions. Has a million miles more or over that of shape driving as a company driver and an owner operator. Uh, throughout his career, he's been an advocate for truckers at the state and federal level, um, serving on entry driver level driver training advisory and was part of the first ever federal CDL standards creation. He has testified before Congress on regulatory matters and he's been heavily involved with the issue, including as part of the National Coalition on Truck Parking. Um, and served as a champion for the state, regional, and local government coordination for that group. Carl Rundell is a consultant with Truck Specialized Parking Services. He is a, joined TSPS's team in 2014, looking at latest developments in architectures, technologies, and applications as the company continues to build out a national network of real-time parking. He's heavily involved in transportation industry from early on in his career, and it was a natural progression to look at how IoT can make an impact in the commercial trucking industry. And he's an engineering and mathematics major from Vanderbilt and started out in the consulting world and as a methodologist for Ernst & Young um, before becoming a serial entrepreneur. So with that, I want to turn this over to Scott and Carl. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you very much, Mary Grace. Yeah, Carl will be uh, catching the questions here at the end and glad to share his knowledge on that. So we're going to be looking at this from uh, sharing our knowledge based upon real-world experience. Me behind the wheel, Carl out there uh, installing these sites. 
But uh, what we're talking about applies no matter how you choose to proceed when you're looking at a real-time truck parking information system. That's a key point there. Looking at uh, what we're going to be hitting on here is just a experience deploying the truck parking uh, systems here. The topics uh, are going to hit are the, from the trucker perspective of looking at the, um, you know, what they need out there, what's important to them, the master overview on the technologies, which systems are best suited for the different approaches out there, because we already kind of hit on that a little bit, the standardization, maximizing that multi-state approach, recommendations and questions, of course, at the end there. So we're going to take a look at the lessons learned there. So when we're looking at a T-PIN system, you know, there is no crystal ball in there. You have where in my truck, you know, that was not installed. And a good example of that here is looking at right where I live. When I was doing research for this presentation, the site's right by me on I-75 in Ohio. So you can see here that at this particular point, there were hardly any spaces available on one side of the interstate. On the other side of the interstate, it was almost completely empty. So that's a key point when we look at, again, truckers not having a crystal ball available to them and needing to know what information is out there. So as we look at this issue uh, over time here, exactly 11 years ago last Thursday, Jason Rivenberg was murdered. This led to Jason's law, which has now been in place for 10 years. And pictured here is the truck that belonged to Michael Bolgoin. He parked in the exact same area where I did when I was a trucker. And it's in this case in Detroit, this was June of 2014, and he was also murdered. So as these studies are going on, and around that same time, the first T-10 system uh, being installed there in Michigan uh, went operational. So again, when I mentioned trucks not having that crystal ball in there, the fact that uh, the drivers need to know what's available to them, and they're agnostic about how they get that information to them. So the good news is, from the real world experience here, we can tell you that you, it's possible to deploy a system in as little as nine months when everything is working you know, really pretty well and depending upon how it's uh, going about the deployment of it. So then at that point, you can start getting that information to the truckers and help save lives out there. So when we look at the uh, multi-state system, the key points here is a seamlessness that's already been mentioned and making sure that all those resources across state lines are visible to the trucker out there and that they're able to see that and get parked on their first attempt, not waiting and not circling around and circling around. Um, so that's the key point there when you get that. And the efficiency of this at the state level, of course, is really good too. But for the trucker, they just need to know what's available no matter what. So let's take a look here at the fact of when you do have that multi-state system, uh, when information is linked together, that provides that seamlessness. This is a map of that real-time information being shared, in this case, taken from our TSPS website. So this is one example of a third-party developer. There definitely are others, as was mentioned earlier. And we freely share this information out there from all the MASTO sites and all the other states that provide the TPIMS information to the public. Uh, we do also offer the opportunity for truckers to revert reserve spaces at some of the independent truck stops that we've worked with out there separately from this. So a variety of functionality available through those third-party applications. Let's take a look at how these different technologies work and the benefits and challenges of those. We've already seen a few questions regarding that and how the information is gathered. So first, we're going to take light curtain. And a light curtain is indeed as it sounds, it's just that when a beam of light is broken as a vehicle enters or exits the site, and it's counted. So the benefit for that is it works very well with a unidirectional flow site. And when I say that, I basically, of course, we mean rest areas. The challenge to that is it can't differentiate between vehicle types, a tractor trailer versus a car, if someone goes into the wrong area, in other words. And because you have to have this at every entry and exit point to count uh, completely and accurately, it's not going to really work well for private truck stop location. So when we move to pucks, being a magnetometer, um, and you saw the picture earlier there, and again, they basically just detect there's a hunk of metal above it. So benefit for that is it can also be used for capturing entry and exit counts where you end in a spot like a rest area. It can also capture individual marked parking spaces, whether they're in a rest area or in a private truck stop type of a setting. 
So the challenge here is it still has only seen the occupancy of those marked spaces. And we already got a question about that earlier, and I'll get back to that in a second. And they must be installed into the pavement, and preferably two per space. And the reason for that, that was touched on earlier, is that when you have someone who's bobtailing without their uh, trailer attached, that trucker might park further back toward the middle of the space. So you need to capture that for sure. And if there is servicing required, if that battery life that was mentioned earlier doesn't work or something come happens, now you have to go into the pavement. So with another thing here is accumulation of snow and ice can also affect the accuracy. Uh, but thankfully, some proprietary software can adjust for that and help to maintain good accuracy. So with video analytics, you have a camera detecting a vehicle passing through or into a zone that you're looking at. And it can also detect, again, individually defined spaces that you delineate. So with this, again, it can do entry and exit counts at a, um, at a unidirectional flow site like a rest area. But also, because it sees those individual spaces, can be used in a private truck stop location, along with a rest area. So the only challenge here really is that you'll see that it only is looking, again, at the individually defined spots or entry exit. You're not getting information about the rest of the facility. So when you put together the combination of the two, video analytics and PUCS, now you're capturing data very well. Uh, the accuracy is up there very, very nice. Um, and the key point here is just being, of course, now you're talking about a more complex system and a higher cost. And, and you still have the individual weaknesses of the other systems. So that's a key point for that there. But it does, of course, bring up that accuracy and keep it, which is what truckers are ultimately looking for. So when you look at uh, moving ahead here, as part of the MASTO project in Iowa, uh, this new 60 gigahertz millimeter wave detection radar system site will be installed within the next two weeks. In this case, it's going into a private truck stop location and will be running alongside the video analytics system for proof of concept. So hitting the the details of what this offers here in, with the new technology is the fine granularity of detail that it captures, and it's capturing the entire area, as the one question earlier alluded to, looking at what's going on throughout the whole site. That data includes as soon as a vehicle enters in the area it's being tracked, the movement within there to the parking space, the duration of time it's been in space. If the vehicle occupant should get out and head toward the restroom, you can actually track that data, or did they go to the vending machine area? Or did they go to walk on a walking path? It can also differentiate between vehicle types. So you could have this set up to provide an alert if someone who's in a non-commercial vehicle enters a truck parking area and lingers. There might be a, not a very good reason for them being there, perhaps. The system could be mounted on, it, on any kind of a pole and easily be replaced with standard electric requirements and data connectivity. When it comes to cold temperatures and snow, it, uh, that does not affect the system. Like the video analytics, uh, snowflakes on that one can cause interference and cause bad counts, but not in this case because the radar can see through the snow, no problem. When you look at cost, when you have a unidirectional flow site of 20 spaces or greater, that's where a system like this comes into being advantageous. If it's 20 spaces or less, a puck system could still handle that capability and come out uh, less. Again, this is all depending, of course, upon a variety of variables. And the individual sensor can capture an area up to 160,000 square feet in size, which is roughly three football fields. So uh, when we look at the system reliability and performance, you know, again, just looking at the, um, you see the price per site here on the data coming up here. But the, comparing these different sites is, you know, a lot of variables. As you'll hear in Andrew's presentation coming up next, there's a lot of different things that go into the cost and what you're getting, but definitely looking at accuracy is, is a key thing. So, and as the Mid America Freight Council is tracking this data, more is going to be available. So some key points here, looking at a uh, chart you saw earlier, but just very brief points from our viewpoint here, and that is that when you see that uh, the design, build, operate, and maintain, that can be a very efficient way to contract. And you when you offer functional requirements as the, what your, your approach for data collection, that allows the contractor to best identify the current methods for this. And 
because of that, we know technology does change. And again, when there's that flexibility allowed, when it's agnostic toward what is the function, out, function the technology you're going to use, that allows for uh, the flexibility for someone to choose the, the most up-to-date, best functioning technology. And last point there is very simply, make sure you're including everything when you look at uh, ONM because down the road, that's something that has to be accounted for, of course, to maintain the accuracy of the system and the functionality. And in keeping everything uniform, of course, is also key. So, um, and just simply here, when you look at uh, the private contractor side of things, that's to be very important here, using private truck stops. And with that, uh, the truckers need here, oops, I'm sorry about that, and go back here with the other one. One other point I wanted to mention with this is combining the sites together, the data that you're getting, means that tr when you have private locations, because sometimes truckers are fine with just a rest area. That's all they need. Uh, just mm -hmm. pulling in to get sleep, get the shower, uh, things like that can be another level. And when it comes to that, showers, maintenance hey, facility, Lord. preparing their truck, that's hey. where um, you have the fact that needing those private truck stops to be brought on board. So basic recommendations here is the fact that you have the um, not reinventing the wheel. A lot has been done already out there. A lot of efforts already gone into this, and uh, there's a lot to look at, including private truck stops in your network ensures that you're going to get the opportunity to hit everybody out there with as best as possible because we all know that it's only about 10% of the inventory is controlled by the states. Make sure that the, whoever you're working with is, you know, or has got the ability to include those private truck stops and be able to uh, deploy it at an appropriate pace. And then keep in mind that ONM and making sure that standards compliance is adhered to. So with that, I'll go ahead and turn it over to uh, questions, and Carl can over that. Um, OK, thank you very much, Scott. Um, first off, I'll just remind if people are to please mute their phone. I know somebody's got uh, some noise in the background. I hope if you can hear me, please do make sure you mute your phone. Um, don't see any questions in the chat box. I will ask quick one sec question. Um, on the radar 60 megahertz uh, with the wave detection that you're deploying, um, for clarification, is that um, an open technology that you're applying some, some of your own uh, uh, software applications to, or is 60 megahertz wave detection in itself kind of an open uh, type of technology that can be adapted. I'm trying to figure out if it's proprietary or if it's something that is open, but yet you all are doing some, maybe something, some proprietary software work with it. And that's probably a question for Carl. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah no, this is Carl. Um, actually, the, the radar itself has been used by the DOD. It was developed out of the Department of Defense. Um, so now we're actually applying it to more of a, you know, it's now being able to be used from a commercial, you know, perspective. So yes, we're adding proprietary software around it to basically create uh, point, you know, the point clouds is what uh, the radar actually creates for the shape of the vehicle. And then we have the algorithm and stuff that turn those point clouds into usable information. Okay. But you're pulling that from essentially now a, a, a technology that's now available in itself, that, that, that radar. Um, 60 gigahertz is now out there for 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 vendors or folks like yourself to grab onto, correct? Correct. And yep. Most of the radar okay. that was used prior was 24 gigahertz. And now they're opened up this whole new frequency. Great. Okay. Thank you, and appreciate that. I don't see any questions, so I'm going to say thank you, and I want to make sure we have absolute time for Andrew and some questions afterwards. So I'm going to turn it over to. Um, uh, our next speaker, which is Andrew Andresco um, from uh, Minnesota DOT. Uh, Andrew is a 10 year of experience in the transportation planning industry, is currently responsible for managing Minnesota's Freight Advisory Committee, the Highway Freight Program there in the state freight plan. He recently completed updates to Minnesota's truck parking study and way station plan, was involved in the planning and programming of the TPIM system in Minnesota. Uh, he's a member of the American Freight Coalition, the American Institute of Certified Planners, and the Certified Geologist in Training. And Andrew, I have to say it, he's a friend to the coalition and also a graduate of the Freight Academy. Hi, Andrew. Welcome. 
Good afternoon, and, and thank you. Um, I wanted to thank the Corridor Coalition for the opportunity to speak a little bit today about our experiences here in Minnesota. Um, we uh, went uh, fundamentally different routes um, than some of the experiences you heard pre previously. Um, our deployment of, of our um, system, uh, we, we agreed to the overall ITS infrastructure that the Mid-America Freight Coalition had developed. Um, our original plans were much more uh, grand than what we were able to afford and able to do uh, based on our uh, apportionment of the federal grant. Um, we had looked at originally uh, over 12 sites. Uh, we pared that down to nine sites and then went down to seven sites total. Um, there's a number of sites that are located primarily on our uh, primary highway freight system, um, the I-94 corridor and the I-35 corridor, uh, which emanate uh, to and from the Twin Cities metropolitan area, which is our major urban center in Minnesota. Currently, uh, MnDOT is uh, technically in a trial phase with the TPIM system. Uh, we received about $1.6 million in total federal funding and matched with uh, a minority of state funds. In our situation, we actually ended up using uh, operating dollars to match the, the federal grant. Um, planning and identifying programming uh, for this particular project at the time that the grant was uh, fully uh, fleshed out was, was difficult. And then so uh, I want to share with my fellow DOTers that uh, one of the, the biggest challenges that you will have is not just um, identifying the federal grants or perhaps uh, the, the internal funding, it's about operations and maintenance itself. Um, one of the challenges that we had uh, was uh, our ITS engineer uh, who managed the implementation of the program and the projects in Minnesota actually ended up moving on and, and going on to bigger things in, in the automotive uh, vehicle engineering area. We have uh, an automated research uh, center here at, in MnDOT. And uh, in so doing, um, I was involved in the funding and programming. Uh, Dan Rowe, who many of you may know, uh, at least from the ITS side, uh, was sort of the lifeblood of, of this uh, project and was a challenge as, as he moved on to identify who would maintain and sort of be a champion for the project internal to our organization. So in planning these systems, if you don't have a tar parking information management system in your area or your state, it's important to identify a champion early on who is able to stay on with the project long term. Having a consistent vision and a consistent champion will ensure that there are no questions about who does what internally. And in, in thinking about that, um, we, we used a fundamentally different approach at least in terms of vehicle detection. Uh, in 2012, uh, MnDOT had done some novel research in the computer science area with our University of Minnesota to develop a truck detection system uh, that integrated into our regional traffic mon monitoring center, what we call our RTMC. At that time, we used uh, what's called stereo spectroscopy, which is using multiple cameras uh, to create a 3D model analysis that is automated in real time and in real space. So that, that contrasts a little bit with the data um, and the information that Scott had presented earlier. This system was not ultimately implemented um, after we had agreed to uh, the ITS uh, overall architecture for the, the TPIM system. We decided that that stereo spectroscopy system would be too expensive. And we ultimately uh, converted those systems to ball camera PTZ monitoring at the sites that they were already installed at. Um, due to the complexity of that system, we went with magnometer sensor pucks. We use the same manufacturer as the Iowa system. Um, we don't use a gate sensor um, or other technology to identify um, parking in locations that are um, unauthorized or are sort of adjacent to the actual truck parking stalls. One of the challenges that we have, at least internal to, um, uh, internal to the state, is identifying uh, the ability to expand um, and right away for, for truck parking. So that kind of goes hand in hand with our installation. Our installation is, is very um, sort of cost efficient. And for that reason, um, that, those are some concerns that we're trying to identify 
uh, on sort of a, a policy basis on what we'll do in the future. In thinking about that, um, one of the things that I also want to point out is that um, in terms of our, our ITS architecture, you saw the Iowa model. In, in Minnesota, the, the data is actually sent to our RTMC through what we call our IRIS system, which is Intelligent Roadway Information System. Our IRIS system was designed in 2007 as a GNU open source uh, advanced traffic monitoring software. Any state DOT or any um, a city DOT or other group can use that system to operate a wide variety of different ITS infrastructure, such as uh, the TPIM system that we're talking about right now. Um, our data goes to, to that system and then is redirected out um, to the truck park, Trucks Park Here website. Uh, it is, is real-time as well as static, so you're able to pick up that feed and, and use it however you please um, for, for your own applications, uh, whether that is something like Waze or whether that's something like um, you know, a, 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 um, an ELD provider. So a little bit different. Uh, and in, in doing that, we also recognize the importance of flexibility within our uh, display of, um, uh, display of uh, the, the information or the audio. Um, I just want to stop here. I, I noticed that David had said that he lost audio. Are you all still able to hear me? Yes. Okay. Yep. I just wanted to double check. Um, I, I didn't want to. I didn't want to keep going on in the presentation and then not be able to, <laughs> to have you hear what I'm saying. Um, one of the things that that we had uh, had done as part of that previous project uh, in 2012 um, was was a movement to standardizing our information display display boards with full color uh, digital message sign boards. Um, so in, in doing the implementation of TPINs in Minnesota, we decided to invest in additional DMS signs um, that we could use in case of an emergency such as significant crashes. I know um, a majority of our, our, um, our other peer states have this problem as well, but we are impacted um, very deeply by, by snow events, uh, particularly severe snow events that can close uh, interregional corridors from our major urban center, the Twin Cities metro area, uh, as well as our regional centers, uh, such as the cities of Rochester, Duluth, Mankato, St. Cloud, and other areas. So it was important as we were thinking about um, getting the most bang out of, uh, out of this project um, to be able to use uh, these signs in a way that integrates with our existing IRIS system and the RTMC the, the costs were significantly higher for these DMS signs, but the ability to use them in, in multiple ways was particularly important, um, as it also aligned with an internal intelligent transportation systems uh, plan that we have devised um, that, that, that aligns with the rollout of ITS fiber wire uh, to the locations where the DMS sign boards and the TPIM systems were being installed. In the past, we didn't have um, ITS fiber wire uh, throughout uh, our, our sort of state, and so that, that was um, sort of aligning these various different things uh, to ensure that we have coordination between efforts beyond just um, the freight office uh, in MnDOT. And so that, that was, uh, I think, also an important lesson learned. We use a 511 system that is uh, identical to Iowa. Um, we think it works very well. It provides a number of different data or features um, that, that can be seen in real time by truckers. Um, all of the information can be uh, monitored or, or accessed from multiple sources. So uh, we have uh, a generalized 511 system as well as a trucker-specific 511 map. Uh, we also provide information over um, weather radio as well as um, the live feed and our website so that um, you have multiple ways to access this data. Um, here's a, a, an example. We do, again, use those PTZ cameras now just for general information instead of stereo spectroscopy. They could theoretically be used for um, the spectroscopy again. However, we don't know um, whether that would be an appropriate way to move forward, just given the level of accuracy that we're able to obtain um, from our, our magnometer pucks at this point in time. I think in, at, at a high level, again, I want to hammer home on this idea um, that um, you know, in terms of system management, 
we are we are doing in our the maintenance internal to MnDOT, having an internal upfront agreement about who does what and which office needs to be funded to do that maintenance is very important. Um, currently, there is discussion within MnDOT as it pertains to the trial of this project about who will be responsible and what type of cost pools uh, will be afforded uh, to ensure that the system continues to operate long term. At least in terms of internal operations, that's very significant. MnDOT has a number of different offices and locations. And in thinking about that, if you're going to implement a system in the future, having a strong champion who gets upfront internal agreement about maintenance, that's very important and something that will ensure the successful and smooth operation of your system in the future. And thinking about our implementation, I mentioned accuracy a moment ago. Accuracy is very important if the data that's being shown on the signboards is, is uh, hard to read, is inaccurate, or is difficult to read. Um, it doesn't particularly, uh, it's not particularly useful for truckers who maybe don't um, use an app to find truck parking or don't use an app um, such as an ELD system to um, route them to and from their, their areas that they need to drive to. Um, having been a trucker myself, um, by driving box trucks and interregional trucks, um, that, that's something that I found it, it, as important as well. We had some issues with our magnometer pucks, and so our average system downtime was a lot higher than the average. Uh, but our accuracy level when the system was working was extremely high. And so for that reason, um, we think that, that, that that's um, the right direction to move forward with in the future. Again, we're not using um, sort of brake beam eyes um, or systems with, with gates. Um, just based on the design of our specific lots, we don't necessarily see those as necessary. And for the most part, um, the areas where we have the highest utilization are in and around our urban areas. So it's something for us to think about as a rural state that um, we don't necessarily have a strong need to uh, monitor um, parking on ramps unless absolutely necessary and mostly in sort of the urban areas. And with that, I am going to uh, sort of turn it back over to the group for any questions you have or, or to Mary Grace to sort of uh, get get back to the overall message. Thanks very much, Andrew. Um, any questions for Andrew? I've um, not quite seen him in the chat box, but let me ask him. Does anybody have any questions they want to jump in on the phone and ask or type in? I see Dave Rosenberg is typing. Um, I put this question. Um, Dave asked, what was the utilization column on the last slide? Andrew, I think you want to explain what utilization was. Yeah, absolutely. So utilization, um, this, is the, this, is, this is the same performance met metrics um, that you may have saw on the other slide. Um, MASTO um, is monitoring the performance um, at, at a quarterly basis and providing that, those reports to the FHWA. So uh, we're providing data essentially through the um, RTMC in our area to Kansas, and Kansas is reporting to the division office on our performance. In this case, utilization is the utilization of the, um, the sites that have the, the TPIM system installed. Um, so uh, really that's just telling you how much trucks are, are being parked while the system is active. Unfortunately, in our, our case, it's actually skewed because um, we, we had such a high amount of, of downtime that our utilization is, um, is sort of lower than we expected. Um, the sites that we've, we've installed the systems are, are located on our areas, our rest areas that have the highest demand. We only have public sites, so we expect that number to rise in the future. Great. Thank you, Andrew. Um, and I just Josh wanted to asked, chime in one thing on utilization. This is Brian. I'm, I'm sorry. Um, go one ahead, thing Brian, I wanted please. to note is we're actually updating this regionally. So the utilization actually looks um, at the entire utilization um, basically during the peak truck period, like so the, basically the overnight uh, parking, um, which is noted there. But one of the updates that we made, we're actually updating, you know, based upon this is the first cut of performance measures that we got. So the numbers will be updated. But one of the things we're actually looking at utilization is excluding Friday through the weekend because we really want to look at peak utilization here because some states actually thought, well, we expected the utilization to be higher because we're being told that there's no parking available. So we'll be kind of looking at that kind of ongoing moving forward. 
And I think, Brian, that kind of may partially answer. I'm going to skip up down to a question. Tom McQueen from Georgia DOT said he understands there's peak hours for truck parking. Has anyone done an analysis in the straighting peak season? So it sounds like, Brian and Andrew, that some of that will be captured in this performance measurement work you're doing, correct? Absolutely. Yep, absolutely. So that's the intention. So now, now we're looking kind of at, at peak times during the week, and then we'll also, when we be able to look at it over the year, we'll also be able to kind of understand seasonal as well. But some of the research that ASTRI has done, um, just, just more nationally too, is looking at things like, like the peak seasons um, in addition to just the peak hours. They, they know where to kind of pull some data from some of their GPS related to which seasonally when is it the highest and different things like that. So there is a lot of data out there too to support something like this that ASTRI has. Okay, and then I'm going to ask, um, and Tom, I'm going to hold your questions for just a second, Tom Phelan, but Ann strauss leader asked, thinking next steps, how or can you use this information to identify locations where additional capacity is needed? So I think for, for Kansas, for Iowa, for Minnesota, um, how are you thinking? I think that's a good point, Ann makes. How can you start to think about using this for where your capacity needs may be? So um, this is Andrew. Um, I just wanted to uh, sort of chime in on, on that question. I think in terms of the big picture, as we move forward in the future, and if we're able to expand our TPIM system, we would use that to identify future locations where uh, truck parking demand might exist. The fundamental problem with that as well, though, is that truck parking um, corridors and, and sort of trends change, right? So the economy changes. Um, in our case, when, when federal sanctions went in, the type of commodities being moved, such as corn, grain, um, soybeans, uh, will, will affect, be affected by those changes. And so in thinking about that, we also need to be sensitive to seasonal patterns or changes to the economy um, in terms of our planning for future rest area capacity or even truck parking on the private sector system, uh, recognizing that the states don't have enough resources to address all truck parking demand. Um, we're thinking about um, could we use this system on if there was a local uh, rest area, for example, there are a few um, sites in Minnesota where the city has several spaces available for um, pr uh, private truck parking. Um, they're primarily in sort of rural areas, uh, but boy, having this additional information at those sites would be helpful as well. Great, thank you. Um, and Tom Fallon had a couple of questions around technology. One is. Um, I was asking if you've done a study to determine the effectiveness of the technology in different environments. Um, I'm guessing some of that may come from the, the data uh, gathering you're doing, um, but that um, is one part of this question. Uh, Anybody respond to uh, how you're, are you are you examining that effectiveness in this particular project um, in terms of comparison? Comparison. Yeah, this is Chuck. I think uh, as far as the eight eight states, that is one of the goals. Um, the the definitely the first and second quarter, we're kind of still working through, you know the you know whatever you want to call it, bugs in the system and. Um, and, but I do think that is going to be one of the big benefits is doing that. We haven't started that yet. We want the systems to kind of uh, settle in and, and also get some information on how the technology is lasting over time, too, which is obviously a big issue when deploying on the roadside. So um, I think, you know, it's definitely an opportunity to get more information. We're just not quite there yet. And then the other part of Tom's question, Tom Phelan had to do with, um, obviously, in your mind, um, in regions where parking facilities are consistently filled beyond capacity, so obviously, you know, a good portion of the eastern part, um, is, do you find that there's a perception of a limited value if you're always going to be saying it's full or there's zero spaces? Um, and was that just, or was, it, was, in, was there enough availability versus demand that you didn't really see that issue consistently in your region? I think what what we've heard from um, truck drivers now, and, and especially those ones that are, you know, are are being full, 
you know, they're having, it's a tougher decision for them because they've got to decide how early they pull off the road. So you do get, you still, even if that's full at night and everybody knows it's full at night, you did get information on those peak shoulders on when, you know, how full, you know, how full is that parking lot early on and they can make a decision if they do need to pull off the road early. So I think even though everybody knows it's full at the peak time, those off, you know, reaching that peak time is, a, you know, useful information even if it is full all the time. You know, and sometimes we also found, and that's kind of why the signs kind of helped at least message where the next couple of sites coming up were um, okay. and, and how full they were, because sometimes we did find that certain lots are consistently always full, but some of the lots are a little less utilized if they could wait another 20 or 40 minutes before they stop if they were able to plan in advance like that and kind of know what's coming. Um, and then I think just the hand-in-hand -hand between rest areas only have so much capacity, but then the private truck stops offer larger lots. You know, we did find a lot of, you know, from the, going back to the Iowa deployment, being able to, to partner public and private sites together does provide a bigger um, amount of capacity. But, but also just the, the information behind, I think, the technology, especially with the entrance and exit counts, where we kind of know how over capacity some of these lots are getting, does at least help inform if, if and when um, capacity could be added to certain lots how much capacity is needed maybe to serve the demand. And so I think it, it still gives good information just about if and when you build future capacity, where is it best to build that capacity. Perfect. Thank you, Drenton. And I have one more question, and then I'm going to kind of swing around here unless there's any major questions because we're really at ending time. But uh, Diane Lackey asked, and then I'll preface this by saying this is a federal grant. It comes to an end, and at the end of the grant, you know, it's up to the states how they're going to carry forward with O and M. Um, I think we all agree that that's part of a federal grant project at some point. Here, it's up to the states to carry on. So, to Diane's point, um, how is competition going to be addressed once the renewal options for software approaches are expired? So, um, I know some of, this, some of this was done individually, um, but in the collective and then individual term, I think that's a good question. What happens next? You've got this system deployed. You've got technology out there. You've got operation and maintenance, you've got uh, a group of states working together to analyze data. Can somebody speak to Corey or somebody, how, what comes next or how is that going to be handled um, as we move forward? You know, she points it's usually a three to five year cycle for software or other procurement renewals. And maybe you're still trying to work that out. Well, this, this, this is Brian. So I, I guess the, the one state that this would pertain to, obviously, is, is Iowa because, as Eric mentioned, they're purchasing the data. So they actually built in that they have um, one-year options, and I think I think it's up to up to five years, and then they would probably have to look to re-procure it. So that is one of the considerations when doing that type of system. Uh, but really, it depends on the individual states because some states are just having their traffic management operation centers do it, and they're doing this internally. So I think it would depend on how you're procuring those those options, whether you're doing that internally or whether you're using a, a third-party vendor to do it. But essentially, the states can pick it up and then move forward within their own Absolutely right. procurement. Right. And actually, Iowa has it included that. that. Yeah, Iowa has it included that basically at the end of that term, they own, you know they have the equipment or they can have the third-party vendor remove it if they choose, uh, but they actually include that within their contracting. And I, and I think um, Andrew's writing something here. Um, did, Josh O'Neill did ask, by the way, um, how much do the dynamic message signs cost per unit? And I'm going to guess that that varies by procurement and um, ITS requirements that the individual states will use. Does anybody have a range on what that cost is? Yes, yeah, so this is this is Andrea. I just wanted to um, comment both on that question as well as Diane's question. Um, being involved with the Mid America Freight Coalition, I know that we've had discussions um, with with the Center for um, Freight Infrastructure Research and Education um, at UW as well as WSDOT and others who are um, the lead state for the Mid America Freight Coalition about potentially. Uh, in involving the cost for the uh, unified uh, truck parks gear database or the central repository as part of uh, an additional phase of the federal research in the future. That hasn't really been decided on, but it's something that's been discussed. You know, I think uh, as was mentioned previously, we have the ability to operate um, sort of uh, through our RTMC, through our open 
open um, GNU software without having additional providers um, such as TSPS or others. Um, so it doesn't necessarily uh, cost us anything additional. We wouldn't necessarily have to solicit beyond having um, sort of a centralized system for the multiple states. And at least in terms of those, uh, that second question, Regarding the, the digital message signboards, um, they range in price. Um, we, we have some that are uh, over the interstate that cost, uh, you know, between three to 400000 because of the infrastructure um, for the signposts, um, especially if they have to have a structural component to them. Um, the ones that you saw there um, range in price between 100000 and and on up. Um, we have have gotten, a, I would say, a value deal um, because we buy so many of them. We usually buy in bulk and then install. Um, that, that's generally what, what ours costs. Um, we're, we're more concerned about the long-term operations component about maintaining those facilities. How do we train our staff? What, what do those ITS integrators or maintenance staff need to know about the electrical components? Um, how do we ensure that they're aware of how all the system works together? Those are concerns that we have at this point. Yeah, this, Great, this thank is Chuck. you. I'll just, I'll just uh, talk about the, because a lot of the states use the kind of hybrid, dynamic, static signs, and those were a little bit cheaper. They were around uh, 65000 per site, and that was per sign, you know, a roadside cabinet, power source, that's kind of all in for the signs there. But, you know, they were a static sign with, three smaller DMS panels on it, so they were some, a little bit cheaper than the Minnesota full DMS signs. Okay. Good, thank you. So I guess, I'm, and we're running a little over and I appreciate that, so I guess I'm going to kind of bring this uh, kind of roundabout to, to a question that I'm posing uh, without any selfish motivation, just we've had this question posed amongst ourselves. Certainly looking at this $25 million application, you know, the work that you've done. So, Brian, I kind of pose it to you, but it's obviously Brian, Corey, uh, the folks on behalf of Iowa, you probably know what's in Phil's head, and certainly Andrew. But to the point of having the umbrella of that multi-state grant application, um, having a lead state, but doing that umbrella under a large multi-state grant, do you feel that that was a considerable force in getting states you know, over eight states to move ahead with deployment that they might not have undertaken as readily or as in this time frame if they were looking at doing individual state applications in that process on their own. Um, so that's the first part of my question. And then the second part was, um, to the extent that you had a lead state with funding to both manage oversight, and, the, and I'll make this point, because it differed from a project we had, which did have challenges because we didn't have individual deployment funding per state. Um, how much is each state having that kind of skin in the game, both in terms of managing the funding, being able to procure and do things to their needs, but also because they've got a grant and they've got specific funding, it brings them to the table. So it's a large question, but I kind of want to bounce that amongst the, the speakers to say, did it make a difference? Do you think it moved things along? Do you think folks did something that they might not have readily done? And, and how important was having, you know, that, that everybody was skin in the game? So I'll give each of the speakers a chance to kind of reflect on that. So, Mary, so Grant, I Corey. might just start because or I, I was just going to say, ahead. you know, well, well, Corey had mentioned that he kind of joined after kind of that, you know, right. initial piece in terms of their middle deployment. So, uh, Corey, maybe I'll start and then you can, um, you know, note anything that I've missed. but. Uh, yeah, back in 2015, when we um, did the, the Tiger Grant application, the states actually committed 10% uh, of the federal funds uh, up front for, for local match. And because it was a rural project, it was 10% in terms of what they were committing. And when they were actually awarded the grant, um, it, you know, it takes some time uh, to be able to actually get the federal funds obligated and get those agreements done. Uh, so they actually committed those local funds to doing the upfront systems engineering and concept of operations. Um, and all of that basically uh, up front in terms of that commitment, and, it, and it were, that was really, really critical uh, in getting the states on board um, and also committed. And then they also kind of set aside some of those funds as well to be able to do the regional component of the project because all states kind of understood the 